great reset coming our way. Right here, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And this is from the World Economic Forum themselves. This is not tinfoil hat stuff, folks. And what I'd point out, you can see this is a tweet from the World Economic Forum themselves. Check out the date below. This is something that they've been pushing for a long time. In fact, Christine Lagarde, who was the IMF Managing Director, keyword Managing Director, uh, she's now the ECB Chief. So this is all happening, folks. So the question is, what is a Great Reset? If you don't know what that is, I recommend you start doing some research because it's coming and it's coming at a speed of light. It's coming very, very fast. And if you're not prepared, this thing is going to turn into your worst nightmare. I want to first point out a couple of things. Number one, they changed their title. The original title, like I said, was Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. And I have to go to Forbes to find their original article. Because now when you look at it on the World Economic Forum's own website, you can see they've changed the title to Here's How Life Could Change in My City by the year 2030. <laughs> so obviously, they had so much pushback on this. They had to change the title. And further evidence, they got a lot of negative pushback on this as they put in a disclaimer saying this isn't their vision. They just want to open this up for discussion. But that was never, ever a part of the original document. This is like Jerome Powell coming out in September of 2019 and telling everybody this is not QE. This is not QE. When he knows, everyone at the Fed knows, the marketplace, and even the average Joe knows darn well, that's exactly what it is. The other thing I wanted to point out is this article was written by an actual adult. And I know that sounds funny, but wait till we get in and start reading some of what they said. It was written by Ida Auken, who is a member of parliament in Denmark. And it's completely shocking that this wasn't written by a seven-year-old. Let's get into the article. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city. Or should I say our city? I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. We have access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. Of course, based on what she defines as needs. One by one, all these things became free. So it ended up not making sense for us to own much. So you don't own anything and things are free. Hmm. Sounds a little bit like communism, <laughs> but more on that in just a moment. It made no sense for us to own cars anymore because we could call a driverless vehicle or a flying car for longer journeys within minutes. Now I can hardly believe we accepted congestion and traffic jams, not to mention the air pollution from those combustion engines. What were we thinking? And this is where it starts to get really bizarre. And keep in mind, this is not only an adult writing this, but this is a member of parliament in Denmark and a member of the World Economic Forum that's summarizing their views on the future. Sometimes I use my bike when I go see my friends. And it's interesting, she owns a bike, but she can't own anything else, not even clothes. I enjoy the exercise and the ride. It kind of gets the soul to come along for the journey. Funny how some things never seem to lose their excitement. Walking, biking, cooking, drawing, and even growing plants. It makes perfect sense and reminds us of how our culture emerged from a close relationship with nature. Now things go from bizarre and creepy to nightmarish. In our city, we don't pay any rent because someone else is using our free space whenever we don't need it. My living room is used for business meetings when I'm not there. Once in a while, I will choose to cook for myself. It's easy. The necessary kitchen equipment is delivered at my door within minutes. Since transportation became free, we
we stopped having all those things stuffed into our home. Why keep a pasta maker and a crepe cooker crammed into your cupboards? We can just order them when we need them. And here's where we go right into the twilight zone. Shopping? I can't really remember what that is. For most of us, it has been turned into choosing things to use. Sometimes I find this fun, and sometimes I just want the algorithm to do it for me. It knows my taste better than I do by now. So remember, all your thoughts and decision-making are going straight into the cloud, into ABC, Artificial Intelligence Brain Cloud. And now we go from Twilight Zone straight into Hunger Games. My biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city, those we lost on the way, those who decided that it became too much, all this technology, those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over big parts of our jobs. Those who got upset with the political system and turned against it. I want to repeat that. Those who got upset with the political system and turned against it. They live different kind of lives outside the city in District 12. Some have formed little self-supplying communities. Others just stayed in the empty and abandoned houses in small 19th century villages. And now we go from Hunger Games straight into Orwell's 1984. Once in a while, I get annoyed about the fact I have no real privacy, know where I can go and not be registered. I know that somewhere, everything I do, think and do, dream is being recorded and their timeline is starting off in 2020 that extends through 2025 and like we already know 2030 it starts with phase one this is utilization of ai and data phase number two they want to institute public use of this ai and data and develop it across various domains Phase three, the ecosystem or economy is built by connecting multiplying domains. An ecosystem is established as various multiplying domains are connected and merged. And they're using the word domain to replace sectors of the economy. So it'd be easier to understand if we just read it in normal human speak. An ecosystem is established as various multiplying sectors of the economy are connected and merged. And then they give us this diagram how it would work. Your data, everything that you say, every conversation, your vital signs, actions, and search history on the internet goes straight into ABC. Everything you do in your life and workspace goes straight into ABC. Nature and urban space also goes into ABC. And you'll notice they push for urban living more and more and more. And I think the reason they do this is so they can have smart cities. So everything is connected to the brain cloud. The more things they can connect to artificial intelligence brain cloud, the more efficiently they can allocate resources. And just be very, very clear, this is how they're thinking. <laughs> this is not how I'm thinking. I'm simply explaining their, we'll call it quote unquote logic. So all the data dumps into what they're calling the artificial intelligence as a service. I prefer ABC and it creates complex application services. And this is just another way of seeing an algorithm that would produce the same data as prices did before. Artificial intelligence then allocates the scarce resources and controls the goods and services produced in the real economy. And just so you can see, I'm not putting words in their mouth. We have an arrow coming out of the, we'll call it the new ecosystem or the new economy, going back into the personal lives of the individuals with new value creation or supply, supply of goods and services. And ironically, they're calling this a virtuous cycle. Now, we all used to joke about George Orwell's 1984. Um, but really, I think this meme really sums it up 
moving it into the nonfiction section because everything in that book is happening and is going to happen. This is so Orwellian. You've heard that saying and it gets used over and over and over again. But it's crazy what's happening. The Biden administration have said that they are going to not just join uh, the Paris Accord, the Paris Agreement, but they are all in on the Great Reset, run by technocrats, a form of collectivism, and a form of control. This is not good news. And here the World Economic Forum says that a digital currency should be adopted as the world's leading reserve currency. Now, what type of reserve currency are they are talking about? Well, Jim Ricketts says there's three options where we are right now. We can either have chaos and do nothing, and you know we're starting to see that. We're starting to see society breaking down. Or we can do what's happened throughout history and go back to a gold standard or a silver standard or a biometallic standard. However, that means governments and politicians and technocrats and bureaucrats, they lose a lot of power because they then have to live within their means. They cannot just create currency units willy-nilly. It puts restrictions on them. They don't like that. They don't like that. So what's the other option? Jim Rickard says it's the IMF's SDRs. What's an SDR? It's a special drawing right. Let's have a look. The Special Drawing Right, or SDR, was created by the IMF in 1969 to supplement the official reserves of its member countries. The SDR is an interest-bearing international reserve asset that can only be held by the IMF, its member countries, and designated official entities known as prescribed holders. In addition to this role, the SDR serves as the unit of account of the IMF and several other international organizations. The IMF's financing arrangements with its member countries are denominated in SDRs. The value and yield of the SDR are defined using a basket of major currencies, which are selected due to their importance in the world's trading and financial systems. The SDR value is calculated daily, while its interest rate is determined on a weekly basis. The IMF Executive Board reviews the composition of the SDR basket every five years. This composition is revised to reflect major changes in the roles of various currencies in the world economy, and thus to enhance the attractiveness of the SDR as a reserve asset. In its most recent review in 2015, the board expanded the basket to include a fifth currency, the Chinese renminbi. The basket will now include the US dollar, euro, Chinese renminbi, Japanese yen, and pound sterling. SDRs are allocated to members in proportion to their IMF quotas and relative economic standing in the world economy. Every five years, the IMF reviews whether there is a global need for additional international reserves to justify a new allocation of SDRs. The most recent and by far the largest allocation took place in 2009 as part of the response to the global financial crisis. Currently, the amount of SDRs stands at over 204 billion. Okay, so the SDR, special drawing right, is just a another, I guess, fiat currency, even though they say it's not a currency uh, or asset, which is backed by a basket of currencies. So you can see the US dollar makes up the majority of the SDR uh, at almost 42%. You got the Euro at 31. Uh, and you can see the Yuan, the Japanese Yen, and the British Pound. And this is in 1944, this is what um, Keynes recommended. He didn't want the US dollar being the reserve currency. Um, and this is this is what they're pushing. This is what they're pushing. They're wanting a digital SDR, a digital currency with an SDR. Um, the global powers don't want the US dollar to be the reserve currency because that gives the US uh, an unfair advantage uh, that, that they claim. To understand this better and to get an idea 
of the details of the plan, let's go right to the internet and a blog post from the IMF and Christine Lagarde. This post is called The Winds of Change, The Case for New Digital Currency by Christine Lagarde. <laughs> So I highlighted a lot of this for my other channel. I did a deep dive about a half hour on this yesterday to check that out, go to my rebel capitalist channel. But the highlights are the main points. For their part, cryptocurrencies seek to anchor trust in technology so long as they are transparent. And if you are tech savvy, you might trust their services. And here's where she starts taking jabs at cryptocurrencies, but honestly, she's going right at Bitcoin. Still, I'm not entirely convinced. Proper regulation of these entities will remain a pillar of trust, as if a decentralized system created by the free market could never have the trust of the general population. <laughs> In order for the people to truly trust something, it has to be a product of the government. Her words, not mine. So then she poses a question. Should central banks issue a new digital form of money, a state-backed token, or perhaps an account held directly at the central bank? <laughs> That's what I was talking about. Available to people and firms for retail payments. The network. True, your deposits in commercial banks are already digital. But a digital currency would be a liability of the state. That may not seem like much, but it's a big deal. More on that in a moment. And here's where the irony gets unbelievable. This currency could satisfy public policy goals, such as financial inclusion. And these are the words we hear Klaus say all the time. It's got to be inclusive. It has to be more fair. It has to be equal. Whether it's the IMF or the World Economic Forum, it's like they have these buzzwords they're using repetitively to get the average ordinary person to start adopting them into their own language. That's the first step of brainwashing someone, by the way. If you want more information on that, you've got to check out Jordan Peterson's research on Nazi Germany. But back to the point. So. Financial inclusion and security and consumer protection and to provide what the private sector cannot. <laughs> and here's the irony, privacy in payments. So the private sector, there's no way they can provide privacy, but the government can give us all the privacy we need, truly Orwellian. So now she gives us an example of the extent to which the central planners could micromanage the economy and control what you buy the next time you go to the grocery store. She says, consider a simple example. Imagine that people purchasing beer and frozen pizza have higher mortgage defaults than citizens purchasing organic broccoli and spring water. I think you can see where this is going. What can you do if you have a craving for beer and pizza, but don't want your credit score to drop? Today, you could just pull out cash. And tomorrow, would a privately owned payment system push you to the broccoli aisle? So what she's saying here is this is why the private sector can't be trusted because they have a profit in loss, you see? So banks in the future might push you to the broccoli aisle because they think, or because their algorithm tells them that if you buy beer and pizza, then you're a higher risk to default on your loan. But when you're reading the IMF and the World Economic Forum's papers, which I've done a lot, you have to read between the lines. 
And in my opinion, she's not saying that this is something we should be concerned with coming from private banks. She's telling us what the plan could be if the central banks or the central planners government controlled the entire network. And I love this next part, how she sets up the central banks as though they're Superman coming into the rescue and to save you from the private sector. Would central banks jump to the rescue and offer a fully anonymous digital currency, i.e. Bitcoin? Certainly not. Doing so would be a bonanza for criminals. <laughs> oh, it's just you can't make this stuff up. So now she talks about how central bank digital currencies would be a perfect solution because they could find some middle ground. Central banks might design digital currencies so that users' identities would be authenticated through customer due diligence procedures and transactions recorded, but identities would not be disclosed to third parties or governments unless required by law. Well, who makes the laws? So when I purchase my pizza and beer, the supermarket, its banks and marketers wouldn't know who I am. The state might not either. Uh, notice how she says might not, at least by default. <laughs> you see, they're always leaving the door open that kind of gives you a glimpse into their true intentions. Anti-money laundering and terrorist financing controls would nevertheless run in the background. Ah, so the government would be monitoring everything. If a suspicion arose, it would be possible to lift the veil of anonymity and investigate. This setup would be good for users, bad for criminals, and better for the state. That is one thing that Christine Lagarde and I definitely agree on, that this whole entire network, these central bank digital currencies would be better for the state, the government, the World Economic Forum, and the IMF. So the main takeaway here in what she's saying is let's just take everything from the private sector or from a decentralized system like Bitcoin, because you cannot trust that. Only criminals use it, and it may jeopardize your privacy. So let's just take everything and move it to the central bank, the central planners, the government, the people we can really trust, and let us, the global elite, micromanage the entire economy, the entire network, and your life. So you're starting to put the pieces together here. This whole great reset, the push for digital currencies, central bank digital currencies, is, a, is, is all about control. The government can see everything we do. The government can monitor all of our purchases. They can switch us off, switch us on if we be behave badly, if we don't buy the right food that they want, if we don't spend our newly created currency, uh, you know, they can, they can say, right, here's your currency. You've got to spend it within seven days or you lose it. Um, so they can really micromanage the economy, which means we have less liberty and less freedom. They manage our, our lives and everything that we do. And, um, yeah, this is, this is not the kind of world that I want to live in, not the kind of society that I want to live in. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is when the uh, CARES Act bill was passed uh, last year, um, in that is, well, the sneaky little thing passing a digital currency or a digital dollar. So once again, this is not conspiracy tinfoil hat stuff. Folks, this is coming. Get prepared. So Rashida Tlaib is a Democrat congresswoman and she tweeted out, mint the coin already. Now, for those who don't understand what she's talking about here, uh, the MMTers uh, have been uh, working on a digital currency, a central bank digital currency, a Fed coin, 
uh, a one trillion dollar Fed coin, and uh, basically what she's saying is let's get this done with. Let's let's just embrace MMT, go full MMT, universal basic income. Don't worry about producing anything. We'll just throw new currency units at everyone. Mm, guess what happens with that? Even Dr. Lacey Hunt, who's a Keynesian and a deflationist, said that he skips out if we get this. He skips over the inflation period. He goes straight from deflation to hyperinflation. This is from an article titled Primer, MMT and Abolishing Government Bond Issuance. The starting point for MMT macroeconomics is to use the accounting procedure of consolidation, combining the balance sheets of the central bank and the fiscal arm of the government the Treasury of the United States. So they want MMT. They want this great reset. They want central planning. They want these technocrats think that they know what's best. But you know why communism, socialism, whatever they want to talk about, but basically collectivism, central planned economies always fail. It's because of this. In an unhampered market economy, the price mechanism is the tool conducive to the most efficient desired by consumers and allocation of resources. Why? Because prices stem from the different subjective value human beings attach to the various consumer goods and services available in the economy. By repeatedly exchanging or buying and selling goods and services, sellers discover the values subjectively attached to consumption goods by demanders the market value of goods. In other words, they understand which consumer values any single available good most, thus allowing each good to find the most eager owner. And this is what we were just referring to in the example of lumber being allocated to either Denver or Detroit. Notice that subjective appraisement of goods value is possible if and only if goods are privately owned by the exchanging agents. And this is what Klaus doesn't want. They want us to own nothing. In fact, without private ownership of goods, exchanging agents could not enjoy the profit rewarding the discovery of the most eager buyers of the goods they want to exchange on the market. They would not be able to attain the highest possible reward for the exchange. Also, absent private ownership of goods, exchanging agents could not possibly experience losses. And this is why I always say that we have to let businesses go out of business. Taking it a step further, let's go to an article titled Price Signals as Guides for Resource Allocation. The market economy depends on price signals to correctly allocate its scarce resources. Scarce resources should command higher prices than more abundant resources. Guided by correct price signals, resource users will use scarce resources with higher prices for only high value purposes, and abundant resources with lower prices for lower valued purposes. And here's the key takeaway right here, guys. If prices are absent or set incorrectly, Resource users will waste resources by using scarce resources for lower value purposes and leaving abundant resources underutilized. And Johnny Bravo here really nails uh, the situation, the problem that we're in with our current economic and monetary system. Here is a huge problem that's facing you. Not, not so much the 30 trillion, but the fact that you are going to have to pay it back, which is currently 22 trillion, I'm sorry, I was off, 222,000 that you will have to pay back. And it is going to get bigger and it will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm also, now I would normally not even sweat it, but uh, you know, 53% of debt to GDP, fine, 34%. Okay, that's doable. This is when it ends, when you're looking at 130%. We don't produce anything. 
We're actually a consumer. It's China that produces everything. And in the end, guess who's probably going to win? You guessed it. The ones that produce, not the ones that sit you know, on the, in their lazy boy and flip through channels and, and complain and, and go America. China is eating us for dinner. And these, the, the, what has happened in four years with the trade, the sur, like, oh, surplus. Yeah. We don't have that. We used to be one of the biggest surplus nations. Now we're one of the biggest debtors. And what happens to that? People lose confidence in us people around the world are like, what the F is going on over there? Yep. They will lose confidence in, in, in who we are. And then that almighty dollar, that printer that we have, we're going to lose that too. And what will be the solution of our government? They got one thing. Well, there's two things, but it's right here. They are just going to tax you to death. That's it. And most of my life, I've been in that 50%, like half of my income. Why? It's the owning the businesses. That always gets me. You just have to make sure you have enough write-offs, right? You buy, you have a YouTube channel and then uh, you make a million dollars. You put a million dollar Lambo behind you. It just doesn't seem wise. So I've always had to pay my fair share. But Johnny Bravo, they're just taxing the rich like you. Well, hey kids, they're coming after you too. Look, oh, I bumped it a few years. There you go. National debt of 50 trillion. Oh, look, your taxes just went up to almost $400,000. Try to pay that one off. Let me know how that goes. And our debt to GDP ratio is now 200%. The game is over. And here's the government solution. Just just print more. More debt. This will work. That yeah, just give Give more debt to the people and then everything's solved. Oh, wait, you don't produce anything? Now, wh what do you think? What's going to go up? Uh, well, good good chance that uh, that gold will go up. Are we going to ri uh, raise interest rates? No, we're, we're pegged at zero. We're not moving that. We cannot pay that debt with anything more than 1%, 2% max. Anything else, the system collapses. Where will you be? when there is a dollar crisis, as if you do not already see it now. What are you gonna do? Do you have a solution? But I have a solution, Johnny, uh, buy gold. That, that'll, that'll solve everything. Yeah, it'll solve everything. Well, until the government says, you know what? Mm, nope, uh, we need that, please. What are you going to do when they're like, oh, give us, g give it up. I'm like, oh wait, I, I seem to have misplaced it. Uh, oh, we heard you have uh, Bitcoin too. Oh, man, I, my private keys. Where did I where did I put those? Actually, I have to step back for a second just to look at this. Two thousand dollars an ounce uh, for gold. Just crazy. I, I've been teaching in, in the high schools for over twenty years, uh, telling, hey kids, just you know, whenever you can, you take these sheets of paper, which are nothing but sheets of paper, and buy gold. Just do it. Just trust me on this one. Okay, Mr. Bravo, but I remember what, 300, 400, that was a common number in my head, but now it's like 2,000, all right. You see, the problem is our Keynesian um, fiat uh, currency monetary system, uh, economy, it's all built on uh, everlasting growing debt. So you need exponential debt just to keep the party going. If uh, credit creation slows or stops, the whole system collapses, the whole economy collapses. All your assets that you think you're rich on collapse. Everything collapses, we all lose our jobs. And so what governments have done is just continue to kick the uh, debt can down the road, hoping to leave it uh, for future generations to deal with. The problem is the debt can is so big now they can't kick it down the road. And that's why they're looking at all sorts of things, uh, inflation to try to try to uh, inflate the debt away. Uh, and, and what's a great way they can do that? Digital currencies, digital currencies. The problem is with, um, at the moment, is uh, velocity is through the toilet. Um, 
how can they get velocity up? Well, they can say to you, oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Jane. Uh, that currency that's just been put into your uh, account with the central bank, you've got seven days to spend it. Or, ta-ta, it's gone. So they can force you to spend. And this is why also we're looking at the whole Great Reset. So instead of allowing free market capitalism to work, where you... Uh, you know, Austrian economists have been saying there's malinvestment, this is just terrible, it's going to end bad, blah, 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 that we should have allowed the deflation, that the malinvestments to, to be washed out of the system so that we could have sustainable free market capitalism. We don't have that anymore. We have crony capitalism, we have corporatism. And Joseph Schumpeter, the great economist, said that that would ultimately destroy capitalism. Crony capitalism, corporatism, will end up destroying capitalism and will end up going to some kind of collectivist system, socialism, communism, whatever, run by technocrats. And that's where we are today. So I'm going to put some links in the description below on some other videos that I want you to watch. If you're not familiar with the whole Great Reset, the IMF, uh, central bank digital currencies, the future that we are about to face, there's no uh, denying this. This is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is directly from their own uh, mouths. These are all the leading politicians, prime ministers, presidents, the World Economic Forum, the IMF, the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, the central banks themselves are all pushing for the Great Reset and central bank digital currencies. So I'm going to share some of my uh, favorite videos uh, from people who have really um, exposed and, and talked about uh, what the Greece Great Reset means. Um, they really paint a picture to it. And also they share some, um, some tips, I guess, or some things about how to protect yourself uh, during you know what we're going to face so here's another video from uh, Heiser says uh, where he goes through this uh, article that says that the great reset is corporate communism and it's coming to America well it's coming to the globe and that's exactly the best way to describe it this is technocrats that want communism they want total control and we're just going along. We, we are becoming the serfs. And it, as I said, it, it's no longer conspiracy theory. There's no tinfoil hat stuff about this. This is them saying it themselves. And in this video, Lynette Zhang uh, talks about, now she's a monetary historian herself uh, and trader. And in this video, she talks about the patterns leading up to currency resets throughout history. Um, and talks about the current global reset pattern that's unfolding. And in this video, uh, we've got, uh, so Jake Juicy's uh, channel, he interviews uh, Lawrence Lepard, um, and they talk about the currency reset coming. Now, Lawrence is a big time investor, especially in the gold and silver mining space, and I found this interview really, really fascinating. This is one of my favorite interviews because um, he goes into the whole monetary system, the macro side of it, and uh, and how we've made these mistakes uh, over and over again and, and pretty much how to set yourself up uh, to really profit in this great reset coming. Yeah, so here's another video from George Gemmon, and I really have to thank George Gemmon for the work that he's done over the last 12 months, as well as Chris McIntosh from Capital Exploits. Um, I can't put a link uh, to his website in the description um, because all the different social media platforms um, don't allow it. So if you want, Google Capital Exploits and check out Chris McIntosh's blog. Uh, and he's written a whole heap of blogs about all this sort of stuff, uh, the whole environmental movement, um, global warming, climate change, all that sort of stuff, and green energy, all that sort of stuff. But this video is, it's a great one. It's um, uh, 
basically the IMF, part of the whole Great Reset, are looking at Bretton Woods 2.0. So Bretton Woods in 1944 is where uh, after World War II, the globe came together uh, to develop a new monetary system. And now we are looking at a new monetary system. So once again, it's not conspiracy theory stuff. This is the IMF saying this stuff. And it's actually pretty scary when you actually have a look at what they are proposing. Um, so once again, I'll put a link in the description of this video. Make sure you watch it. So I think this was uh, uh, a video George did about the, the fed, the media, misinformation around the whole Great Reset. It's actually pretty pretty sad with what's going on and basically how everyone's asleep um, to all this. And they want you to be asleep. They don't want you to realize what's going on. And uh, anyway, once again, I highly recommend spend some time, watch this video as well. So all I'll say, folks, is don't get classed. You've seen what the World Economic Forum, the IMF, the central banks, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank, uh, politicians, presidents, prime ministers, what's what, what they're pushing. Um, for me, it's not a society that I want to live in. So the question is, how can you prepare? How can you do something? Because I think this is coming. I don't think any of us can stop this now. It's all the global elites that are in control. They've got the power. They're pushing this. This is happening. And so how do you not get cloused? Well, let's have a look at my suggestions on what I'm about to do, how I'm preparing, and what I recommend you consider doing as well. So here's my five tips for surviving the Great Reset. My first tip is to get some physical gold and silver. Now, gold and silver has been a store of wealth for thousands of years. Uh, it's been used as money, or well, it is money. Uh, the dollars in our bank account, the dollars in our wallets, in our back pockets, it's not money, it's currency, and there's a difference. Um, but getting physical gold and silver, because if things do get bad uh, from, a, from a worst case scenario, it may come to the point where we may have to buy things using gold and silver. So yeah, as well as uh, being a store of wealth, uh, I am a big investor in gold and silver, both physical uh, as well as gold and silver miners and explorers, um, as many of you know. So get some gold and silver um, you can get that at uh, your local uh, precious metals dealer reputable precious metals dealer uh, for those in australia you can um, buy uh, physical metal uh, from the perth mint now you can have it stored in vaults you can have some on your possession somewhere or whatever that's entirely up to you um, you want to have it fairly close by um if you if you need it if things do get potentially bad the second one start a business um so it could be an online business you know uh, with a lot of work from home now um you know I, I think a lot more people are, are using technology so i think an online business would be a smart way to go basically you need a secondary income uh, if you're PAYG or um, you know whatever your whatever your job is, um, you know things uh, you know will be forced to make choices, and that may mean losing our employment if we do not obey our masters. And so having a second secondary or even multiple sources of income. A lot of very successful people I know have multiple sources of income, uh, but there's lots of opportunities to have other sources of income. Um, you know, starting online businesses, doing blogs, YouTube channels, writing, 
Um, you, know, you can sell products online, set up an Amazon store or um, you know, the, the Facebook version. What's that one? It's escaped me right now. Um, you know, you can um, you can create a trading account. So, you know, my uh, business, which, um, and I'll probably share a little bit in a second, but um, I have an online trading business. Um, so having multiple sources of income is something that you may want to start thinking about and preparing. Um, I know some people drive Uber and do some other things outside of, uh, their nine to five job or their employment, but you want something where you can be very flexible and you'll see that with number five. Invest in hard assets like commodities, which society needs. So if we're moving to this whole green revolution, um, this green wash, and um, once again, I recommend going to Capital Exploits website, uh, Chris McIntosh at um, Capital Exploits and check out his blogs. He's written a lot about uh, commodities um, and the whole greenwash, the green revolution. Um, he doesn't call it renewables, he calls it rebuildables. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that right now. However, that's where society is heading. Now, what are solar panels? What are electric vehicles made out of? What, what um, um, wind turbines? There's a lot of minerals and a lot of commodities that need to be mined to make these things. Now, they have a shelf life. They don't last forever. And so there's going to be a lot more commodity usage as we uh, electrify the economy. So invest in hard assets. So obviously physical gold and silver, but other things like copper, cobalt, nickel, zinc, um, uranium, um, you know, oil's still gonna play a part gas uh you know oil we can't make just about any product in our household without oil anyway i'm, I'm going to get off onto another tangent here but um uh, society needs commodities and commodities have never been cheaper if you've looked at other videos of mine you'll know that for invest in water and soft commodities so soft commodities is food um, for me where I'm looking uh, at investing in this is really it's step four and step five is mixed together uh, which is quality farmland um, and perhaps consider moving out of the cities if you're able to work from home now uh, if you're able to start an online business if you don't have to be in the city uh, with what's coming you've seen their utopia what they want if you want to live in that society, by all means, stay in the city. I don't. And I'm preparing that move now. And so I want to get quality farmland that's got uh, water, either running water, bore, you name it. Um, I want to be able to grow uh, my own food. Um, I guess as a kid, I grew up on a farm, so I've got, um, uh, you know, I've lived that life. Um, and I think that's where I'm going back to. Um, so to be able to grow my own food, to uh, feed myself, my family, but also I want to you know, help others, my neighbours, people I don't know. Um, and so if I can um, produce a surplus of goods beyond what I need, uh, then that will be good, and that is where I'm looking at doing so soft commodities is is food you know corn you know you, you name it um and I, I look i really think becoming more self-sustainable as you can will be better um i don't know maybe maybe you look at this video and think it's all hogwash i mean it's coming from their own mouths it's not coming from me um, this thing's happening. I don't want to be living in the cities when they've got these smart cities that mixes AI and um, you know human beings. And I just think this is a uh, Orwellian society that I don't want to be a part of. And um, 
even in that blog post by that uh, Denmark politician who wrote on the World Economic Forum's website that there will be these people that live outside the cities and they kind of live old school and, you know, da da da. Mate, that sounds so much better than what, what she's dreaming up. So these are my five tips for surviving the Great Reset. These are things that I am investing in, things that I'm doing. And uh, yeah, so what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Um, love to see your opinions in the comments below. Um, do you think this is happening? Do you think it's all hogwash? How are you preparing? How are you preparing? Um, yeah, I'd love to love to see your, your your opinions in the comments below. Am I wrong? You know, do you think I'm I'm a fool and a tin hat guy? Um, anyway, guys, once again, if you like this video, please hit the like button. Help helps the algorithms and all that sort of stuff. So you know, more and more people uh, can see it. Um, you know, subscribe, share, all that sort of stuff. So you get all my videos. So you get notified when I do new videos so that you can be up to date with the best macro um, information. Obviously coming from an Austrian uh, economic perspective. So anyway, thanks for joining me on this video. I'll see you again on another episode of Finance Uncut.